بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Uh, we start the specimen paper and we do the further questions. I uploaded a video on question 1 and 2 this morning. And now this is going to follow uh, that video. So please have a look at this and see. Uh, I'm hope, I hope that this helps you in your future exams. We will be doing question 3, 4 and 5. Uh, and hopefully 6 if we can manage it in this video. Uh, starting with question 3, the unicellular fungus. Whatever. I mean, I don't usually read these on the question, these names because they give me a little bit of a palpitation. So the unicellular fungus Clubermyces lactis is found in dairy products. It is a safe microorganism to culture for the extraction of the enzyme lactase. So we culture these fungi because we want to get the enzyme lactase from them. So lactase is an enzyme which catalyzes the breakdown of lactose, a sugar found in milk. Fine. The reaction catalyzed by lactase is summarized in figure 3.1. Let's look at figure 3.1. So this is lactose and we get galactose and then there is something missing. So there's a question mark here and there's something here which we needed to add so as to get it, uh, get this reaction going. So describe the reaction that is catalyzed by lactase using figure 3.1 to help you in your answer, identify Y and product Z. Now product, identify Y and product Z. So in your answer to this, now look at the marks for it and there are four marks. So that is pretty, pretty a uh, lot of marks for that sort of a question. Just, uh, looking at the diagram, what do you see? Well, I see the first thing I see is the disaccharides to monosaccharides. Then what is Y? Y has to be water because water has to be added for this uh, reaction to take place. So what was that? What was the addition of water? What is it called? It's called hydrolysis. So you, as you said, Y is water, you got a mark for that. You said hydrolysis reaction, you got a mark for that. You said glycosidic bond broken. So this glycosidic bond is broken. So you got another mark for that. And then what is Z? Z is alpha glucose. So this is how you would have answers. And then detail of the enzyme action. Is it an induced fit or lock and key? You could have said anything. You could have also given me the details of it, saying that it is a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond, which is broken. You might know that, you might not know that. So I now refer you to a diagram so that you can remember all this. If you look at all these uh, different, uh, now this is lactose, it's a beta 1,4. Then you can say this is a sucrose, it's alpha 1, beta 2 glycosidic bond. And then in lactose, it is a, this is lactose. So in the lactose, it's a beta 1,4. But in maltose, it's an alpha 1,4. So lactose beta 1,4, maltose alpha 1,4. And this is an alpha 1 beta 2 glycosidic bond. So if you know about it, fine. If you didn't know about it, fine. It's not something that you must know. It's not in the mark scheme. It's not in the syllabus, actually. But there's just additional information which you might have been taught. Going to the mark scheme, disaccharide to monosaccharide, Y is water, hydrolysis reaction, glycosidic bond broken, Z is alpha glucose and beta 1,4 glycosidic. But this beta is in bracket, so if you had it just written 1,4 glycosidic bond broken, that was correct as well. So any four of these and you got your four out of four. Now coming to the B part of the question on a commercial scale. Commercial scale means we need it in tons and tons of it. Immobilized lactase can be used to produce lactose-free milk. One of the products of the reaction shown in figure 3.1 acts as an inhibitor of lactase. So what happens is that this lactase enzyme is working, right? Now the glucose or the galactose will come and get sticks to it somewhere, inhibits it, and this active site changes. This is product inhibition. Product inhibition means that the product from them, the reaction inhibited. So the lactase active site is lost. Now that means lactase cannot work. Now explain why this product inhibition is useful in the actual yeast and in the actual, sorry, in the actual fungus when lactase is acting as an intracellular enzyme. So inside, this is acting inside the unicellular fungi, but it can be a disadvantage when we have extracted this lactase and is used free in solution for the production of lactose free milk. We are using it to produce lactose free milk on a commercial scale. Tons and tons of milk is passed through this. But then you have to understand, you know, look at it, the disadvantage. You see, in the, in the, in the fungus, in the unicellular fungus, it is, an, it is an advantage because now this got enough glucose. 
It doesn't need, it's not a waste, it's going to waste. So we've got a lot of glucose, so the glucose comes and stops this lactase from converting more of the lactose. So in a way, it's good. It's a sort of a control and maintaining the balance in for the uh, breakdown of lactose. So there's going to be no osmotic problems as there's going to be no buildup of monosaccharides. But when you're doing it on a commercial scale, well, you're going to have very slow rate of reaction because what we want is the product continuously. But here, what is going to happen? We're going to have a loss of the product. So there's going to be reduced productivity, less of the lactose-free milk because as the lactose-free milk is being produced, the glucose is inhibiting the lactase. So we're going to have problems with that. So understand the question first that we're doing this on a commercial scale and now we have problems on this because we're saying, okay, what is the, what is the, what is the benefit to the actual fungus? There is a benefit because it controls. Just like if you made a lot of ATP, well, we want the uh, mitochondria to stop making ATP because maybe you're sleeping, so your muscles are not working that much. So no more ATP should be produced by the process of aerobic respiration. That is, of course, if you have done A2, then you'd understand that. So this is the part one of the question. Then it says part two, suggest how using immobilized lactase for the production of lactose-free milk helps to reduce the pro problem of product inhibition. Well, naturally, products and enzyme are kept separate and the product is removed immediately. When we are getting the lactose-free milk, we are removing the lactose-free milk all the time and the enzyme is immobilized, so that is kept separate and uh, the product, which is the lactose-free milk, is being removed all the time. Then we come to part three. The first large-scale production of lactose-free milk with an immobilized enzyme used lactase trapped in a cellulose triacetate fibers. So just one feature of cellulose triacetate that makes it useful as an immobilizing material. Now, naturally, if we have immobilized it, it has to be inert. It has to be unreactive and should not be digested by the lactase. Number two, it should be non-toxic. Number three, it should be insoluble so that it should remain sticking to that. It shouldn't sort of come off it and it should have a long shelf life. So you could have come up with any of those points and you would have got your one mark for that. See part of the question now. When developing an enzyme catalyzed reaction for use in industry, the progress this is again a syllabus point. The progress of the reaction is studied. Outline how the progress of an enzyme cat can be experimented, can be investigated experimentally. But naturally, you remember this if from the syllabus you remember it. There are two ways by which we can study the rate of enzyme action. And the first one is disappearance of substrate. How long does it take for the disappearance of substrate? So you mix the substrate and the enzyme, and now it takes two minutes for the substrate to finish, or it takes 10 minutes for the substrate to finish. Okay, so you know which one is going faster, or you could have said appearance, disappearance of substrate, or you could have said the rate of appearance of product. The rate of appearance of product. Now, of course, if you remember any practical that we are doing on enzymes, let's look at one basic practical, amylase. So amylase breaks down starch to maltose. Now, if we can find out, okay, when will all this starch be finished? It took three minutes. Well, that gives you the rate as well. Or if you said, okay, it takes five minutes for all the maltose to be produced. So it is the disappearance of the substrate or the appearance of the product. Now, it's very easy to do these questions because if you have understood the chapter on enzymes, you can do any of these questions. So the first thing we said, study the rate by disappearance of substrate or the appearance of product. One mark, take samples at in timed intervals. So you would have to test whether the starch is completely gone or not. Of course, I'm going to the same uh, example which I earlier gave you. So take samples at time interval, either for the star or either for the substrate or for the product. Then plot a graph of the substrate concentration against time. That is, always remember, rate is always time, always time. Then maintain a constant pH and temperature, or you can calculate the initial rate of reaction, which is, of course, another very, very technically correct way to study the uh, progress of the enzyme catalyzed reaction. Oh, let's look at question number four. Figure 4.1 is a diagram of a section through root part of a young root. Now you can see these are the cortex cells and then you can see this is the root hair cell and then you can see uh, X which is the root hair cell 
and then the soil particles and you can see this film of water around it so you can see the film of water very well shown around it and then of course you have the epidermal cells and exos describe the pathway by which water passes from the soil to the cells of the cortex shown in figure 4.1 so basically we've got to trace this how is this water going to enter here and then from this cell into this cell and then from this cell into this cell and this cell into this cell but please do not take it further do not take it to the xylem and then how it is pulled up into the xylem because you probably would have done that but that they're only asking you this so i mean the correct reference is what you're going to refer to what Number one, there is the apoplast pathway, which is along the cell wall. Apoplast pathway. If you gave me more details about it, the cell wall, through the cell wall, between the cellulose fibers, you got a mark for that. There are two marks for that. Then entry, how is water going to enter the root hair cell? That is across the partially permeable membrane of this root hair cell, and that is going to be by osmosis. So you're going to start it with from the soil into the root hair cell and that is going to be a by osmosis because there is a partially permeable membrane involved in that. Then when it is entered here, then it is going to go from cytoplasm to cytoplasm. So from the cytoplasm here to the cytoplasm here got you another mark and then it is going to move through the plasmodesmata, which is of course not shown here, but from cell to cell through the plasmodesmata. And of course there's another pathway and that is called the vacular route. So you could have said that, you might know it. I don't usually teach that. Vacular root is water crosses the tonoplast and then into the vacuole and then again out of that and into the next cell. So these were the points which you were supposed to give me for this part of the question, which is a very direct question and a very easy question. So a quick glance through it, apoplast and synplast through the cell wall between cellulose fibers, entry into root hair cell by osmosis, cytoplasmic root by the plasmodid meta from cell to cell and vacular root. Well, I give this to you, so just in case you don't know how to word it, so you learn how to word it and you learn the correct biological English. Then the last part of the question is figure 4.1 shows the location where mineral ions in the soil enter the plant. There is a greater density. Density is what? Density of mitochondria and more mitochondria per cell in cell X, which is the root hair cell, than in a cell of the root cortex. So a cell of the root cortex maybe has five mitochondria and here there are 20 mitochondria density. With reference to the uptake and transport of mineral ions suggest why there is a greater density of mitochondria in cell X than in a cell of the root cortex. So very simple. Mitochondria needed to produce ATP. Produce ATP produce ATP or if you said provide energy but what did you write which is a reject I'm sure you remember what is that that is if you said produce energy now that is a reject produce energy is a criminal thing to write I get very angry when somebody writes that and I see that on a script so produce energy why because energy cannot be created or destroyed and you write that very often because you're not careful about it you're just very casual about it and you write it. And the other is, of course, why? Because mineral ions uptake is by, mineral ions enter the root hair cell against the concentration gradients. While the mineral ions transported through the cortex cell is a passive, but they're dissolved in water. So number one was to produce ATP and the other is against the concentration gradient. So if you said that, you got another mark for that. There's only two marks for it. So against the concentration gradient, the third mark scheme point, which is also allowed, was transported through the cortex cell passively dissolved in water. Because the question was, with reference to the uptake and transport of mineral, suggest why there is a greater density of mitochondria. So that finishes this question, and now we go on to the next question. Question five was on transport in mammals. The sinoatrial node, SAN, and the AVN are two regions of the heart. Explain the role of the SAN and the role of the AVN. Now, that's a very direct question. So there's no ambiguity about it. Either you knew it or you didn't know it. So for the SAN, you could have said the pacemaker sends out impulses, initiates heartbeat. And for the AVN, you could have said acts to relay impulses to the ventricles and introduces a delay 
the ventricular contraction so that the atria contract all the blood enters the ventricle there's a slight delay and then of course the ventricles contract so it was an easy three marks and i'm sure all of you would have got those three marks then coming on to the b part of the question it says figure 5.1 shows features that are observed in transverse sections of three types of blood vessels blood vessel wall of three layers thin wall relative to lumen diameter thick wall relative to lumen diameter and wall of one layer now complete figure 1.1 by stating the type of blood vessels indicated by d e and f that was very easy d was the vein e was the artery and f was a capillary well if you wrote it in plural capillaries that was also allowed if you wrote veins or arteries it was all correct then as we go along the question the inner layers of the wall d and e d and e is vein and artery are composed of endothelial tissue list two structural features list two structural features of endothelial tissue now very simple one cell thick so they were all all this is one cell thick so you could have come up with that what else could you have said flattened thin cells then what would you have said smooth surface yeah anything which has this thing has to be smooth it couldn't be rough that would be very dangerous for so smooth surface so you can see what are the main themes uh, single layer flattened thin cells or you could have said pavement cells or square bus cells and of course a smooth surface facing the lumen so oh, it was a pretty easy and that was for six marks now let's go on to the next question in a dividing cell in a dividing cell dna replication occurs before mitosis steps in dna replication are outlined in figure 6.1 Complete figure six point one filling in the gaps using the most appropriate terms. Helicase enzyme allows the DNA double helix to unwind and the hydrogen bonds between the two strands to break, exposing the four bases A, T, C, G, and all this would be one mark. The name of these bases. So A is adenine. I mean, if anybody got that wrong, I mean, I think that child would not be in my good books. Thymine. C for cytosine, spelling must be correct, and G for guanine. So one mark for all that. You got all this correct. You got one mark for that. Then an enzyme molecule attaches to each of the two separated strands. The two enzyme molecules move in opposite directions and catalyzing the formation of a new strand of DNA. This enzyme is known as DNA polymerase. Then number three, DNA dash. The monomers of DNA are free in the nucleus for the synthesis of the new strand. DNA nucleotides. I'm sure everybody knew that as well. That was an easy question. The bases of the DNA monomers form hydrogen bonds with the bases on each separate parental strand of DNA according to the rules of complementary base pairing complementary base pairing now that's a, of course this is what i keep on saying english has to be pretty good if you have to have a good english command to really be able to do these questions then question five, part 5 one dna strand is synthesized continuously and then synthesized in sections known as okazaki fragments the fragments are joined by an enzyme called dna ligase this is of course new to the syllabus this okazaki fragment was not in the uh, old syllabus and the last part is six the result of replication is two dna molecules each one containing an original parental strand and a newly synthesized strand this type of replication is described as semi conservative replication semi conservative replication right this was for 6 marks so just giving these names got you the 6 marks b part figure 6.2 is a photomicrograph of root tip cells at different stages in the cell cycle and cell in metaphase is labeled cell in metaphase is labeled sorry a cell in interphase is labeled 
Now, what is JK? So, complete figure 6.2 by naming the stages of mitosis is shown in each of the JK and L. Now, if you remember, this is the syllabus point to be able to identify these on photomicrographs. So, that is why they're asking you this question. So, J is metaphase. Now, it's a little confusing, but you would have to figure it out. It has to be any of these. Then, K is uh, prophase. And what is the way I make you remember it? P for prominent, M for middle. And then, of course, L is telophase. But anaphase was also allowed, so you could have said that as well. So that was also allowed. Then coming on to the next part of the question, state one feature of the cell in interphase visible in figure 6.2 that shows the cell is not in early interphase. Why is that? Because it's a large size, same size as cells in mitosis, same size as the cells labeled in stages of mitosis. So large size, So if it's in late interphase, that means it would be getting ready for mitosis. So they are all the same size. So the different cells of the stages of mitosis means so it's nearing the start of mitosis. Please remember interphase is not in mitosis. It's only prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, which is in mitosis. Then it says uh, part three. Part three is describe the stage of mitosis shown in cell J. Let's look at cell J. Cell J is metaphase. So, I mean, you just have to describe that. So, describe the stage of mitosis in cell J. Important mark scheme point was this one, that the, chromo, that the chromosomes have oriented or arranged at the spindle equator or at the metaphase plate. I have mentioned, of course, only the metaphase plate. Now, this was the essential mark scheme point. And then any one from the, the, the these ones, which any one from these attached to the spindle, Chromatid still attached at the centromere, spindle fully formed, nucleolus has disappeared, and nuclear envelope has broken down. So any one out of these, so any one out of these, but this was the essential mark scheme point that why is we say it is in cell J is metaphase, because they are at the metaphase plate, or you could have cell they have arranged at the spindle equator. So it is also called the equatorial plate. So that finishes this paper and uh, thank you for watching. Please inform your friends about this channel uh, because I do not have any social media account by which I can propagate this channel. Please do tell your friends and uh, do subscribe because it matters to me when my number of people who subscribe have increased. And of course, you'll be informed when any new videos are posted. So best of luck uh, in your studies. And I will keep on posting uh, the specimens and all the specimens will be posted in a short while and uh, maybe in a day or two because I'm going to work on these uh, videos these two, three days. Thank you once again.